on today's podcast. Photobiomodulation is using different light frequencies to get biologic effects, essentially. Now, this can be as basic as using bright blue light to sync your circadian clock. That's kind of technically photobiomodulation. But a lot of times we're zooming in on these red light frequencies and some of the infrared light frequencies that go along with it. Where should my IGF be? Interesting thing with IGF-1 and mortality is the optimal mortality for IGF-1 occurs just higher than the 50th percentile. So somewhere around the 55th to 60th percentile is where the optimal mortality is. We're kind of beyond that viewpoint where the lower your IGF-1, the better. Mm -hmm. It definitely seems to be helpful for certain disease conditions like Alzheimer's. If you're a healthcare provider tired of just treating symptoms and ready to dig deeper into the root causes of health issues, the Vibrant Wellness Podcast is for you. With insider tips, expert interviews, and the latest in biotech research, this podcast will take your patient care to the next level. Hello, and welcome to the Vibrant Wellness Podcast, where we dive into the fascinating world of health and wellness, bringing you insights from the leading experts in the field. I'm your co-host, Dr. Emmy Brown, and I'm joined by my wonderfully curious co-host, Melissa Gentile. Today, we have a truly exceptional guest, Dr. Daniel Horzempa, a trailblazer in the realm of integrative and functional medicine. Dr. Horzempa's journey into medicine is as compelling as it is inspiring. It began with a personal health challenge. This experience ignited his passion for understanding the root causes of disease and led him to a career dedicated to looking at the person as a whole, not just treating symptoms. Trained under the guidance of renowned Dr. Andrew Weil at the University of Arizona, Dr. Rosempa is among the select few who have completed an on-site fellowship in integrative medicine. His clinical interests span a wide range from disease prevention and longevity enhancement to hormonal optimization and holistic approaches for cognitive decline, which we'll focus on today. Today, he's here to share his wealth of knowledge and his holistic approach to health and wellness. So let's dive in and explore the integrative pathways to vibrant health with Dr. Daniel Rosempa. Thank you so much for being here, Dr. Rosempa. How are you doing today? I'm doing well. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah, of course. Thank you for being here. So, you know, I, I teased a little bit in terms of how you got into in integrative medicine and medicine overall. Do you mind walking us through a little bit more about your personal story? Yeah, absolutely. So I in about, I think it was sixth grade. So I would have been in that kind of 12 to 13 year old range. I started getting migraines, which started relatively mild and you know, long story short, progressed into pretty severe migraines. So my sixth grade year, you know, I, it progressed to the point where I couldn't go to school. You know, I kind of had to do a lot of my assignments from home. I almost had to like repeat my sixth grade year mm. because of these headaches, uh, which just became pretty much all the time. Nothing really would stop them. And I went to many doctors and many, you know, healthcare providers, integrative practitioners during this time. So started at my family physician who was amazing. This was still at the time where he could spend even in an insurance model, like a lot mm -hmm. of time. And he did. And he got me on to kind of specialist after specialist. I saw traditional Chinese medicine folks. I saw homeopaths. And it was, you know, kind of one of those things that looked like it was never going to get better. And I saw a headache specialist at the University uh, of Texas Southwestern, UT Southwestern who at the time was a pretty well-known and renowned uh, headache specialist. He was a neurologist. I think his name was Dr. Francis. And I actually have his book, believe it or not. Uh, my mom found it like a few years ago and gave it to me. I went to see him. It was like a six-hour visit. Wow. Uh, very extensive. And at the end, he told my mom, he has a virus. And I want you to build up his immune system. I want you to give him some of these herbs. I want you to give him some of these supplements. You know, he kind of put together a full plan and yeah, we were kind of off to the races with that. And that was kind of the breakthrough at the time. Like, you know, my mom found organic food, you know, which was like, was not a thing. We started eating organic. Like we did a bunch of stuff and the headaches got better. So I kind of started from being on the patient side and that's really what piqued my interest, especially in this kind of deep investigative style of medicine, which now, you know, at the time there was there was really no term integrative medicine, mm -hmm. uh, but thankfully now we we kind of have more terminology that describes this, and that's what brought me towards uh, eventually kind of being trained in integrative medicine. That's fascinating the virus, and I wonder 
and what virus like it, hindsight i'm wondering are you thinking about pans in that scenario was that what that doc was thinking and yeah it's a great I know question what I was talking about back then or you know barely anyone i wonder if that's kind of what he was thinking as far as the headache and just neuropsychiatric yeah yeah it's, it's a great question i mean it's and, and it may be and maybe at the time I, yeah i don't know when pans that terminology came into existence but right uh yeah. i suspect it was not happening in the night this would have been probably not to date myself too much but kind of the mid 90s so yeah interesting um, yeah Awesome. Well, Dr. Horzempa, I know that you work with a lot of patients uh, with cognitive decline and neurodege neurodegenerative disease, including Alzheimer's. And I know that you use a holistic approach that goes far beyond the status quo for those conditions. But I really want to know about your Bradenson protocol, the Recode protocol, kind of how you use it, what it is, if you can just break it down for us. Yeah, absolutely. So I mean, going back, I first heard about Dale Bredesen about 10 years ago. I think he was publishing some of his first studies at that time. And I really just tried to piece together what I could read from the papers initially. Now, you know, you fast forward a few years, he starts training clinicians. And that, you know, I, I was all over that as soon as he started training people. But it's really a protocol that's evolved over the years. And certainly we got to the point where we started where it was metabolic optimization. And it... Uh, I cannot remember the name that he used, uh, but it had to do with metabolic optimization of neurodegeneration. Hmm. So I don't think it was MOND, but it was something like M's and then ending in ND. But it evolved into RECODE, which is reversing cognitive decline in early dementia. And it started to go well beyond just the metabolic side of things as well. This is where he started to incorporate mold toxicity and, and recognizing how mold toxicity plays a role with cognition. Certainly other toxins, heavy metals got brought in. We started to look at, you know, it's just been such an evolution over the years. Every year there are more, there are additional things that are being added as we get more and more science. So it's really kind of gotten to the point where it's always a core of lifestyle. And, you know, if you think about it as a pyramid, we want to, to take care of the base of that pyramid first, which is always going to be how people are eating, sleeping, moving, and dealing with their stress. So that has remained a core with the Bredesen protocol. But again, we've started to add on, you know, dealing with detox, dealing with or, or adding in things like photobiomodulation, you know, uh, hyperbaric oxygen. I mean, like there's so many things that are now being layered into it as we get more and more data. So, Yeah, I've heard actually a lot about hyperbaric oxygen, and I, I think it's truly fascinating kind of the changes that can can happen with that. Yeah, I mean, it's it's. Yeah, it's, it, it's really interesting. We've had a center that we've referred to in uh, New Orleans a few times that gets really great results with I, Dr. Harsh, I believe, or maybe Hirsch. I, I'm sorry if I'm messing up his name, but he d is really got a transformative HBOT center there and has people who come to him from all over the country. And I've had a few patients go out there and get good results. So. I'm wondering, Dr. Rosempa, before we, we move on, I wonder what, what's unique about that hyperbaric oxygen that Dr. Hirsch, and we'll get it correct in the show notes if you could send it to us for that uh, New Orleans clinic, because a, a lot of providers are jumping on the hyperbaric ox oxygen wagon, if you will. So do you know kind of, you know, what, what what's different about his approach? Is there anything that's special about why his seems to be maybe getting great results? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, I and really, I don't know because it's it's kind of pr it seems to be somewhat proprietary ah. his approach, and so like this is one thing I tried to get at. Like we have a few places in town. Most cities have at least a couple places doing HBOT, but you're not necessarily guaranteed to get the same result that he's getting, as he has years and years and decades and decades of experience with HBOT. Uh, he's been doing it for a long time, and so it, that's kind of the tricky part is the yeah. lack of standardization. You know, knowing now in general, like most HBOT is going to be at least three times a week. Usually you're doing 40 or 50 total sessions. So people may spend two or three months, you know, doing dedicated HBOT. But yeah, going to, back to your what's special about that center, I don't really know. Unfortunately, yeah. <laughs> I wish well, I did. And maybe it is frequency, the course of the treatment. You know, I'm sure there's different settings as far as the concentration of, of oxygen. I mean, and I'm speaking from an ignorant place here, but just interesting to think about. And I think it's nice to have uh, have, have someone noted who's getting great results and, you know, and it's used for so many different things. Yeah. And we're doing, I mean, we're, we're just starting in our practice doing VO2 max testing. 
we really think that that's the data around that is really, really strong. And so our 2024 project is getting VO2 maxes on all of our patients and being able to track that serially. And there's, there's data with that on dementia as well. Wow. That's awesome. I feel like that's awesome too, for the patients to be able to see it on paper, the improvements over time as well to kind of make it real for them. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's kind of falls in that, you know, functional biomarker, you know, there are, you know, blood biomarkers, obviously that, that I do order a lot of, but then there's also these functional biomarkers, VO2 max, grip strength, and the data on a lot of these is really quite strong. So. Wow. It's amazing. So going back to this or continue on the conversation about this special protocol, is there any specific cases that come to mind when thinking about all the patients that you've kind of taken uh, through this protocol? Is there anyone that kind of stands out that was a really great story that you want to share? Sure. Yeah. I mean, I've had a few, but I think probably the ones that, you know, they, they come to me having recently left, they can't work any longer mm -hmm. and they've recently left their jobs and they're you know, they love their job. They, they draw tremendous amounts of meaning from it. And we've had several people who go through the protocol and not overnight, but over the span generally of about a year will, you know, get to the point where their cognition has improved enough that they can go back to work. And those are some of the, you know, really special cases. I think on the other end of the spectrum, having people who are just borderline needing to go into assisted care. I've had a few of those come in and we just have to have the discussion that this may or may not work. This is a protocol really for much earlier stages of dementia, but they want to try it. So we do, and we get, we don't reverse them fully, but they get better enough where they can still live alone and have a really high quality of life. So that, those are kind of two ends of the extreme that really have, have meant a lot to me. Yeah. I mean, that's a lot to get a patient to be able to get back on their feet and get back into work. I mean, that's going to be a, you know, life-changing for them. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And when it comes to these patients, I'm really curious to hear if you see that there's a really common denominator between the patients that you're seeing and, and these same cognitive issues. Like, is there a certain, it's probably different for everybody, but is there like a certain toxin or anything that you're just kind of seeing across the board that in most cases is, is kind of a commonality? Yeah, I would say a couple of things come to mind. So it, you guys have probably heard this term metaflammation which is this metabolic inflammation. So it's kind of a combination of like insulin resistance and low level inflammation. And that is a pretty common presentation of folks who come in for Bredesen. So he does different, he uh, kind of categorizes dementias for, uh, from the biomarkers basically. So you have a inflammation you know, category, you have a uh, insulin resistance, metabolic category, trophic factors, toxins, vascular risk, and then traumatic brain injury uh, or history of TBI type category. And so the, those first two, the insulin resistance and inflammation are very common presentations. And it really makes sense because we, from the data, we think that about somewhere between 85 and 90% of people over the age of 65 have some degree of insulin resistance. I keep, we're hearing everywhere now that, you know, Alzheimer's is like the type three diabetes. And exactly. You know, like, yeah. You know, I've yep. definitely hearing that a lot lately. Yep, exactly. The other one I, I can say accounts for about two thirds of the cases I see is uh, mold toxicity uh, or, you know, mycotoxicity specifically. So the, you know, the having a inflammatory response to these mycotoxins. Right. And I want to pull on that a little bit more, Dr. Rosempa. You talk about as we get older, insulin resistance developing in a lot of folks. Do you think there's a link between, I mean, so many contributing factors with blood sugar dysregulation? Sure. But do you think there's a link with the mold as far as endocrine disruption? Yeah, I think there is. And I think if you look back, you know, 15, 20 years ago at some of the like shoemaker labs that we would, that we would draw, you know, prior to urine mycotoxin testing, yeah. I mean, cortisol was on there, you know, so th there were, you know, there was hormone stuff on there for sure. And, you know, leptin was also part of those, those initial uh, mold toxicity labs. And, you know, leptin issues are really pretty tightly linked with insulin resistance issues. Mm -hmm. So you have leptin resistance and insulin resistance that are very common to occur together. So. Interesting. And what about that link between the leptin and the, the mycotoxins? I'm not familiar with that, but it just sounds like there's something there. Yeah. And I think it may go back to some of that inflammation, some of the mm -hmm. inflammatory cytokines that are involved in 
the kind of chronic inflammatory response syndrome or mold toxicity can actually, we know that these cytokines can interfere with leptin binding with its receptor. Mm. So you get this leptin resistance happening. Right. And we just keep pumping it out and there's, it's not registering the, the signal. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. And then of course, leptin being one of two of these hormones that fat cells produce, but in this case is meant to, to signal, you know, uh, satiety. If you're not getting that signal, you know, that would, you know, could encourage overeating. Right. You know, so I'm not aware. I, I, I know there's data that suggests insulin resistance drives leptin resistance, and there's also data suggesting the other way around. So I don't think it's firmly established which is driving which, but they do occur a lot together. So. And when you're treating in these patients with uh, mold toxicity, insulin resistance, all these different issues, I'm sure the protocol kind of looks a little bit different for everybody. But when it comes to the role of nutrition, do you have specific guidelines that you give to your patients? Are you do you have everyone kind of adhere to a specific kind of diet? Is it different for everyone? I'd like to know your thoughts kind of on trending diets, like whether it's carnivore or if you do like time-restricted feeding, any, any type of guidelines that you really recommend? Sure. Yeah. Um, I think the ketogenic diet is probably the most common one that I recommend because there is some data suggesting, so there's mechanistic data with ketone, uh, ketones being a preferred fuel for neurons. There is some trial data suggesting that ketogenic diets can be useful for cognition as well. So I think for a lot of our patients, and on top of that, going back to the metabolic disturbances that I discussed earlier, you know, a ketogenic diet is amazing for that as well. So it tends to be a spectrum of a ketogenic diet and a Mediterranean diet, because both of those seem to have the best, uh, the best data with, with dementia and specifically with Alzheimer's. So we're, I'm going to look and see how insulin sensitive someone is and put them somewhere on that spectrum. Now they may, if they're pretty insulin sensitive, they may be able to tolerate a little more carbohydrate. Maybe we're not doing keep the, the strict ketogenic diet, but we're more lower carb, but encouraging a lot of more Mediterranean diet type foods like fruit. I do that as well, but it, it kind of depends on what those individual, uh, that individual typing looks like. So that's such a reasonable approach when we talk keto, keto, excuse me, to blend in Mediterranean based on the individual metabolic profile. I think that's very clever because keto can be so extreme, you know, not very sustainable for many people. So I like that you're blending in something very reasonable, like a Mediterranean, depending on the case. Yep. Yeah. And I think uh, I can't take credit for it because I first saw uh, these Spanish, they call it the Spanish Mediter or Spanish ketogenic diet, I think is what oh, they call okay. it. There's in the, the literature. Yeah. Uh, and it's researchers in Spain and they're basically saying, let's blend a Mediterranean diet with a ketogenic diet. And I was like, Very oh, cool. that's a great idea. <laughs> so, yeah. I yeah. like awesome. that approach because you're not fully sticking to one or the other. You're kind of just curating what you need. I love that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And over time you can, almost everybody who has insulin resistance in the Bredesen protocol will become insulin sensitive over time. Mm -hmm. Almost all of our patients get to the point where they're insulin sensitive. And then maybe we lean more on that Mediterranean side of that. So you're not necessarily keeping patients on a ketogenic diet very long term. It might just be a phase, like a phase one or a phase two. Correct. Yeah. And then once they're insulin sensitive, you know, we're, we start talking about cycling carbohydrates, a lot of different ways to do that. The, the literature is pretty sparse here on how to know how to best do that. But uh, nevertheless, we, we do cycling carbohydrates and that can be done. You can cycle them in a week, a month couple of days a week. There's a few different options there. Or it may just be a seasonal thing where mm. summertime, there's more fruit, you know, more carbohydrate. Evolutionarily, we would have been eating more uh, carbohydrate during that time. Maybe we cycle in a little more and a little less in the colder months. And more daylight to be active. That's the first thing that comes to mind for summertime and more carb. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. Fascinating. I've, I've always noticed that people seem to be more insulin sensitive in the summer months. And I don't know if it's the activity or the sunshine or I, it's probably both and probably other things as well. But yeah, uh, but there is something about that seasonality. Maybe less stress, you know, less cortisol. I don't know. I, there's yeah. a lot of different factors there. That's fascinating. I'm so glad you brought that up. Th that's a big part too. Yeah. I mean, it's, I'm into my January appointments with a lot of my patients now and the majority, 
say, yeah, it's been a stressful couple months. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, as much as we all love the holidays, uh, they can be very stressful. So. Right. Well, even good stress is stress. And, and there's, you know, a lot of uh, difficult uh, stress during the holidays for a lot of us, but like all the, the food and drink and indulging and then seasonal affective disorder. So that's yeah. fascinating. And I, I have to know when I, you say carb cycling, I think about within a day. So the seasonal thing is news to me. But what about within a day? And maybe I think that that may have been as far as the, I haven't looked at the most recent literature, but it seems like we used to think eating carbs at nighttime might harmonize our cortisol a bit better and then having lower in the morning. What's your take on that? I think that's kind of fallen by the wayside as far as I know. Well, it's tricky because we're more insulin resistant. Most people are more insulin resistant at night mm. and most insulin resistant in the morning. So it kind of, or mo most insulin sensitive rather in the morning. So it kind of depends. If you're dealing with somebody who's pretty insulin sensitive, and yeah, they're having some sleep disturbances. It does seem like starch in particular mm. can help sometimes normalize sleep schedules. There, and there is a little bit of data on that. Um, and I think you're right. I think some of it's cortisol related. Um, some of it may be serotonergic. Mm. Um, but now we also have to, we have people doing, uh, and, and most of my patients have wearables. And so uh, we can look at that data too. And it's, it's pretty clear that like eating too close to bed is bad for sleep quality. So we have to sometimes balance all of this. So it's tough to give one single answer on this. But yeah, I have recommended carbs sometimes in the evening time, mm -hmm. farther out from bed as a way to maybe normalize sleep. But I've also sometimes had people put the carbs earlier in the day mm -hmm. uh, if they're more insulin resistant. I think we have to talk about wearables. I mean, that sounds yes. like a buzzword. I see. Yeah, I know, wearables. Melissa, you want to know about this. I was just going to mention, actually, my <laughs> ring will give me notifications in the morning like, hey, did you eat close to bed last night because your heart rate did this and your sleep did that? So yeah. it is interesting to hear that you're you're seeing that in your patients, too. Absolutely. Um, yep. Do you, you have you an aura? Like, yeah. An aura I, yep. I've had it for probably maybe 14, 15 months now. I, I really couldn't live without it at, at this point. So yep. yeah. yeah, I have one as well. <laughs> awesome. There you go. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Is that awesome. the aura ring? Just for the, our listeners who aren't, who aren't watching. Oh, oh. yes. It, it's the aura ring. I've used whoop as well. So, you know, I have some of my really, some of my patients who are really data uh, driven folks who, you know, some of those engineer types who really get into the data, they love whoop because you get so much raw data. But I think aura whoop, I mean, there's, there's a lot of options these days, but if I'm recommending to a patient and they're starting you know, with a wearable, they don't have one and they're going to get one. Yeah. Usually it's going to be aura or whoop. Now, if they're looking more at sleep and stress and recovery, I don't know. I, I still think the aura probably is maybe beating out whoop slightly. I'm sorry, whoop. But if you're also looking to do activity tracking, I think whoop does that far better. So, you know, I don't know. It, it everyone has their favorite. That's, that's definitely true, but that's something I've observed. What's the format of the whoop? Is it also a ring or is it something else? Yeah, it's usually worn around the wrist. Okay. Yep. They Excellent. have straps though that people can wear. Like if somebody's working out with it, they can uh, you know, put it in this strap that'll go around their upper arm. I know the NBA, play some NBA players were getting in trouble for wearing it for some reason. I can't remember mm -hmm. the full details of the story, but I heard that they were putting it in headbands. Oh, geez. So it's anywhere where it contacts your skin essentially, but most people wear it around the wrist. Ah, uh -huh. Okay. Yeah, I, I'm familiar with Whoop. I just saw a podcast where they had their principal uh, uh, researcher on there talking about sleep. And I, I definitely want to dive into sleep with you. We're hearing more and more about the importance of sleep and kind of shocking stuff like, you know, if you're if you're awake during certain hours, uh, you know, it can really lead to so many different health risks. So but before we get to sleep, because we'll talk about that kind of in the context of cognitive decline, and we're just getting so much great information here as far as therapeutic modalities. I saw that you also manage peptides, Dr. Rosempa. Mm -hmm. yes. And that's something that we had a clinical pharmacist on and she spoke to it a little bit. But I'd love to know, I think it is, we're talking about it more and more, but like absolutely there's no standard, right, with the peptide therapies and indications. And so can, for a beginner, and I'm absolutely a beginner when it comes to peptides, can you speak to how do they work and what are the indications for peptides, at least kind of in your practice? Sure. So peptides are short chains of amino acids. There's no real standard terminology here. I've heard less than 40 amino acids. I've also heard less than 50 amino acids. But I mean, these are very tiny molecules. And it's also important to understand we have thousands of peptides in our body naturally that are, are just there as signaling molecules 
naturally. So naturally, though, as people uh, begin to learn about these and study these peptides, uh, they start to make their way into mostly compounding pharmacies. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I, sh I should go into your question. You can get them online. They are for research purposes only is how they're labeled. And I strongly recommend against it because you just don't know if it's somebody making a peptide in their garage. Mm -hmm. And there have been cases of non-sterile peptides being injected oh. and people having repercussions of that. Terrible. Yeah. And, so, and it is IM generally? Are there also nasal uh, route? Uh, yep. There are nasal ones. There's a few you can take by mouth and most of them are subcutaneous injections. Okay. Got it. And yeah. who's a good candidate for peptide therapy? Kind of, you know, is this, are these the, the folks with Alzheimer's or are you using them kind of across the board? Maybe someone who's trying to optimize performance? Yeah. I mean, definitely, certainly both cognitive decline and performance. I mean, I can speak to each of those. There have been some peptides like dihexa, uh, which have some data on improving some of the growth factors mm -hmm. that, that help with kind of neuronal function. Now, it's always tricky to find some of these. It's not always, but we go through periods of time where certain peptides become tougher to find. Mm. It's not that they're being made illegal, but it's just how they're being, how the FDA is phrasing the safety data uh, to the compounding pharmacies, essentially. So I always only order these peptides from compounding pharmacies, but if they're getting letters saying, we don't want you compounding these, sometimes it gets it gets tricky from that perspective. Um, right. But for the most part, peptides are quite safe. There's about 100 peptides in kind of mainstream pharmaceutical medicines. Um, so insulin, for instance, is a peptide. So there you and, go. You know, and there's uh, a class of peptides that has recently, you know, been very popular called the GLP-1 agonists. Mm -hmm. So things like Ozempic and Wagovi, they're peptides. Mm -hmm. They made their, they're part of kind of pharma now, but they are peptides. And really there is, hundreds of peptides now. And so it kind of depends on the individual patient. But yeah, certainly peptides like dihexa that optimize growth factors are an option. There are peptides that improve growth hormone mm -hmm. and IGF-1, which I, I'm always checking levels on patients there. But if somebody is very low in, in growth hormone and IGF-1, then those peptides are an option. So like adult growth hormone deficiency, for instance, mm -hmm. which you can just give them growth hormone as well, but it's often very costly. So these are nice in that they work with the, the body's own production of growth hormone. And okay. so they're peptides that are working upstream of growth hormone release. Mm, so maybe a little bit more cost effective and maybe a little bit even more root cause with using the peptides. Am I understanding that? Correctly? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. And those same peptides uh, are very popular in the kind of performance realm as well, mainly f because of the recovery effects of growth hormone. You know, uh -huh. so growth hormone... I think people think because it's in bodybuilding that it's very, very, very anabolic. Mm. And really at normal physiologic levels, it's not that anabolic, it turns out. It's not anywhere near steroids, some of the steroids that are out there these days, you know, or even things like testosterone. Um, so I'm not saying though that once somebody gets a vial of growth hormone and they take a hundred times the physiologic dose, certainly then we, we start to see some of those effects. But the nice thing about these peptides is they're playing within the lanes of what your body can naturally produce. Ah, uh, okay. So what kind of metrics are you measuring on folks who are taking uh, that peptide for performance enhancing, for example, in terms of, you know, uh, athletic benefit? What kind of, are you seeing anything on labs improving? Um, yeah, like I said, some of it goes back to those functional markers. So some ah. of it, uh, you know, so things like VT, VO2 max mm -hmm. uh, can improve, muscle mass can improve, uh, we have a, an in-body in our practice that we use mm. to measure muscle mass. So I've definitely seen that improve in patients, you know, after a few months of being on peptides. It can be really good post-surgical to help with recovery, mm. either in athletes or non-athletes, you know, quite frankly. And there's some other peptides like uh, BPC-157, uh, GHKCU, that we may pair with some of these growth hormone-releasing hormone peptides also. Yeah. That can help a lot with recovery from surgery or injury. Yeah, there's really an art to it, it seems, as you said, you know, maybe a lack of standardization, but also if you're using them judiciously and safely, there's a lot you can do with them, depending on- Absolutely, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, Very it's cool. definitely somewhat of an art, but you can measure a lot of, you know, going back to your question on measurement. Yeah, you can measure, IGF-1 levels are going to be the most stable mm -hmm. to measure with these growth hormone releasing hormone. Growth hormone is very phasic, and a lot of times we're doing these peptides before bed. 
uh, because that's when you get your natural growth hormone release mm -hmm. is during deep sleep. So a lot of times we're, we're not, we couldn't measure at the time really that we're, we're trying to get that growth hormone peak, but IGF-1 is very stable. We can measure that. And a lot of times what I'm seeing is you know, somewhere in the realm of 25 to 40% increases in, in IGF-1. That's impressive. That's a big chunk. Okay. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. And you can, the interesting thing with IGF-1 and mortality is the optimal mortality for IGF-1 occurs just higher than the 50th percentile. So somewhere around the 55th to 60th percentile is where the optimal mortality is. So really, we're, we're kind of beyond that viewpoint where the lower your IGF-1, the better. Mm. It definitely seems to be actually helpful for certain disease conditions like Alzheimer's. And that's probably what's driving you know, slightly higher than average IGF-1 levels being beneficial for overall mortality. Okay. Thank you for clarifying that because I think that it can be a little controversial as far as where should my IGF be? You know, it's like what range and depending on who you're reading, what study, it's <laughs> you get a million different opinions online. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, the one time I will try to drive IGF-1 as low as possible is cancer, active cancer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because yeah. you're just trying to drive all your growth factors down as Makes much sense. as possible. Yeah. That's important to note, to, to clarify as well. And I should clarify too, that patients who have active cancer are not, not candidates for these growth hormone releasing hormone peptides. Fair. Um, okay. This might be out of context, but I am just, I want to get all the information we can on the therapies I'm not familiar with, whether or not they apply to um, folks who are, you're taking through the Bredesen or dealing with cognitive decline, photobiomodulation. This is a new term for me that I found on your website, Dr. Rosempa. What is photobiomodulation and who's a good candidate for it? Are you using it for your Bredesen protocol patients? Tell us yes. all about it, please. <laughs> sure. So photobiomodulation is using different light frequencies to get biologic effects, essentially. Mm. Now, this can be as basic as using uh, bright blue light to sync your circadian clock. That's kind of technically photobiomodulation. But a lot of times we're kind of zooming in on these red light frequencies and some of the infrared light frequencies that go along with it. And they can be kind of subcategorized as near infrared, far infrared, medium infrared, just based on the, the, you know, the, the nanometers of, uh, of these infrared rays. But it's basically most of the data that were you, or most of the data that's out there is on this red light therapy range, which is usually about 600 to 700 nanometers and the different infrared light ranges. Um, which will be, you know, usually higher than 800 nanometers. Okay, so yeah, you're really using it all. Yeah, I love it. We're, we're trying to. There yeah. is a uh, for the Bredesen specifically. The challenge is, uh, and there's a ton of companies that make these red light panels now. So you know, uh, I won't I won't name them all, but there's a lot. But the challenge with the brain is getting it through the skull. Mm -hmm. So the the one that we often use for the Bredesen protocol is the V light. People also call it the Violite. I'm not quite sure what the, what the company's preferred pronunciation is there, but it's a device that basically uses an LED that goes into the nasal, uh, oh. into the nair, actually. So you're, you're trying to go through kind of the nasal sinuses into the brain. And there's some uh, focused scalp electrodes uh, that they use as well to get these red light frequencies into the brain. And it's, it's now at the point where we've probably had over 50 studies um, for various conditions, but one of the conditions that's being heavily studied is Alzheimer's. Wow. And so I had, I have, I'm trying to uh, envision this. Is it up, it's up the nose or up the nair and it's, the electrodes or either one? It's super high up the nose. Yeah. <laughs> it's not super high up the nose. Okay. Um, it, it'd be like, you know, uh, it'd be like maybe going in a, an inch or so or something like that. Okay. So it's not that it's having to go way, way back in the nasal into the nasal passages or into the sinus passages. It's Same. bright enough that it, go, it just be kind of being there in the nose it's is shallow. going to, yeah, is going to go through the sinuses because we just have less, just less bone to go through. Yeah. You know, it, you, you really have this very small cribiform plate that separates the brain from the sinuses basically. And so you have a lot less uh, resistance to right. these, these light frequencies. Going and is it used way. paired with the electrodes at the, the scalp or is it that, that an alternative uh, option? I think they sell it both ways, but most of the protocols utilize and most of the studies have utilized both. Interesting. <laughs> That's, That's new one. for me. Yeah. It's the first yeah. time I'm actually hearing about it myself too. It, it's, it sounds like it's 
kind of newer? So are you kind of one of the only practices that you can go to to get this kind of therapy? How, how common is it across, across practices that you've seen? I don't know. It's tough because from being inside the Bredesen community, we've all known about it for a few years now. But yeah, I have to say most patients don't know about it who come through the program. And yeah, I, I don't think it's really gotten to the point where the general public knows much about it other than the panels, you know, the, the large mm -hmm. panels that people can buy. Yeah, I've definitely seen those ones for sale, the large ones that, you know, you can do like a, a full body. But I have actually, I have heard too as well, like, you know, there's some studies that say it can penetrate the skin in certain areas and some, some people say it doesn't. So it is interesting to see, you know, how you're using it on, on the brain there. Yeah, I mean, it started out, um, they started out using these frequencies with lasers, you know, mm -hmm. prior to LED technology. Um, and it really started out in dermatology, you know, um, and it still has a, um, a, a huge usage with skin health, you still can see the red light masks that like cover like the whole face. You oh, just yeah. have like these little spaces for your eyes. <laughs> so that's still being utilized and there is data there as well. But I think it, it really kind of, it took me by surprise when I first learned about it, that it ha can have an effect on the brain. We will also sometimes pair it with a, a very old drug called methylene blue, mm, okay. which there's some evidence that the two synergize because they both work on complex four in the mitochondria. You know, the red light, will, uh, you know, basically the photons of red light will actually uh, interact with cytochrome C oxidase uh, in the mitochondria. Uh, nitric oxide dissociates, so you get a increase in nitric oxide levels, and then cytochrome C oxidase actually works a little better. And so you, there's mitochondrial function is probably the root of how both red light therapy and how methylene blue is probably working. So that may be why they're, they work together so well. I've actually tried that therapy myself. I've done one of the methylene blue uh, IV bags and then went into the red light after that. So I only did it the one time, so I can't really track progress or effects, but it is, it is quite interesting. Yeah. Yeah. But I did want to kind of switch gears here and kind of look at integrative and lifestyle medicine just come from a broader perspective here. And I wanted to ask you, when you're seeing general patients, is there an area that you prefer to look at? first, where you like to go in and start making adjustments? Like what is priority when starting with a new patient to reduce their disease risk overall? Yeah. So all of our patients fill out a pretty extensive questionnaire, which I read usually before the first visit. And that usually lets me kind of get a sense for what questions I'll need to ask. Um, and usually I'm spending about an hour each time I see a patient with them. So I'll ask those follow-up questions. So a lot of it starts, I guess what I'm getting at is a lot of it starts with just subjective talking to the patient, reading questionnaires that they filled out, trying to get a sense of what they need. Um, and most people will have, going back to lifestyle, uh, most people will have at least one of those major lifestyle categories that they need some help with. It could be nutrition, it could be sleep, could be stress, could be exercise and movement. But almost always I'm trying to zero in on, on those lifestyle categories first and foremost. Now they may have toxic exposures, they may have childhood trauma. They may have dental issues. They may, on and on and on. There's so many things that are in our questionnaire. Um, but I generally am starting with those, those core lifestyle factors first. Right. So kind of looking at sleep, stress, history, just kind of everything all together. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And then we can start to, based on their individual, uh, you know, past their individual, what's going on with them now, what's happened to them in the past, we can start to formulate a plan. And of course, also taking into account the biomarkers. Which segues to our next question. I'd love to know more about labs, Dr. Rosempa. You, you spoke to blood sugar, you know, but, and you also mentioned advanced biochemical testing on your site. So I'm curious, what are you referring to with that term? Are we talking about like fractionated lipids when, you know, rather than just a standard lipid panel, or are you referring to something more specific? Well, yes, to answer your question, yes, certainly uh, some of it is going to be advanced lipid panels. So looking at, and so it could be an NMR advanced panel, it could be a gel electrophoresis, could be ion mobility, but, you know, getting a sense for people's, you know, particles, LDL particles, yeah. HDL, VLDL, LP little a. So that is definitely part of my lab workup with, with pretty much everybody is looking at those advanced lipid metrics. And of course, ApoB, can't leave out ApoB these days. Also, definitely looking pretty comprehensively at hormones. So thyroid hormones, sex hormones. Uh, I, may, I may do uh, multiple labs at different phases of a woman's menstrual cycle just to get a sense for, uh, for what's going on there. Certainly, uh, you know, dried urine testing or salivary testing 
is another thing for hormones that I will do quite often with patients. You know, looking at biomarkers of inflammation and oxidative stress, looking at sometimes looking at biomarkers of endothelial function, so like blood vessel health. Uh, so it's a lot. I mean, it's, yeah. we have like pretty much a phlebotomist who, you know, uh, goes to our patients' homes, draws their blood. Uh, you know, I, I know her really well. Uh, she's been, you know, doing this for several years for the practice. And so she knows how, to, you know, she knows the specifics of some of these more specialized labs. So a lot of times I'm, you know, getting these labs drawn by her and that way people aren't having to walk in cold to a, to a lab and then have a, a lab tech have to look up, well, I don't know how to draw this lab or that lab because I, right. I never see it come through here. So, Yeah, there's, there's so many specifications when you get into those uh, maybe less commonly ordered labs, especially when it comes to the functional medicine testing. So, yes. Um, yes. you know, even if it's just a urine test, it's in a kit and, you know, we've got great instructions for that, but it still can be, you know, a little bit confusing for some. But on that note, you mentioned mycotoxins earlier. Are you, you are you using urine mycotoxin testing or using any blood markers too to assess for mycotoxin or, you know, SIRS, mold illness overall? Yep. I'm curious how you assess those patients since they're so it's really standard way of working those people up. Yeah, I, I think I've largely changed to the urine mycotoxin testing. It's so good. It's so accurate these days. I mean, and we're being able to test more and more mycotoxins. That's another key point mm -hmm. is, you know, it's up to a dozen and a half, a couple dozen mycotoxins now. And I think initial, uh, initially, if you go way, way back to like real-time PCR, maybe they were checking five or six. Mm -hmm. So we're, I, I just think the, the ability to, to directly test those mycotoxins uh, which is really what we're concerned about. Oftentimes, I will go that route first. However, I, I do sometimes do the blood the SIRS markers as well, more to get a sense for how much it's affecting, uh, you know, the the kind of intricate network of their body. Because some of the SIRS markers are hormonal. Some of them are uh, inflammatory cytokines. You know, some of them are peptides. You know, MSH yeah. is technically a peptide and also a hormone. So sometimes I will do that as well. But more commonly these days, it's urine mycotoxin testing. And of course, you know, having the patient, it's two sides of the same coin where you have the urine mycotoxin testing and then having them do home testing or work testing or wherever they're spending their time. Yeah, I'm really curious about how often do you see those correlate? Because I think that can be a pain point for a lot of practitioners and patients, obviously. Um, yeah, I mean, it, uh, it correlates not always, but, but often. Now, sometimes people will say, yeah, I had mold in the last house I lived in. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes it can be a bit of a battle to say, well, let's test this house too. We have a 25% chance that this house, no matter how new, will have some mold in it. So sure. we, should, we should still check it. But it may be a distant exposure. And so, yeah, I mean, it, it doesn't always, I sometimes do have people come back. And like I said, it, it's, it's normal environmental testing. They do have urine mycotoxins that are positive. We don't have a definitive past exposure. But at that point, I usually will say, well, let's, let's treat it, but then uh, let's not worry about having to do any environmental testing here because you probably, you probably picked it up at some point in a workplace, in a previous home or apartment or, or something along those lines. Right. Could have been a transient exposure. And yeah, there's, there's ways yep. of kind of assessing that. So all right. Well, I think that's helpful for testing. And I would love to know a little bit more beyond our, our biochemistry testing, our physiological testing, if you will. What about, and I want to mention for listeners, you have, you have a cognitive test on your website. I think that's great. It's linked all over your website. Such a good screening tool for folks to access on their own. So thank you for putting that on your website. And I really wanted to mention that for folks. Um, about brain training tools, apps. You know, I'm familiar with Lumosity. What kind of, I mean, and testing is different than brain training games and apps. So I'm getting ahead of myself. But just in that realm, what kind of tools are you using uh, to assess folks and also maybe think about prevention also as far as mental exercises? Yeah. So to assess, I, I do do the uh, clinical tools that we, you know, use as largely screening tools. Mm -hmm. So mini mental status exams, MOCAs, more so so I have a language that I can communicate to other practitioners that may be involved in the care of my patient. Right. So if they see a neurologist or a neuropsychiatrist uh, or neuropsychologist, it's good to have that language for them. Mm -hmm. But we do use a online cognitive testing platform called Creos, 
there are several that are out there, you know, that do this, this similar thing, but, uh, you know, I, I was approached, uh, they, they are formerly Cambridge brain sciences. So I was approached pretty early on by them and I was able to look at a lot of their data and, uh, and how it correlated with, you know, longer neuropsychological testing, because that is truly still the gold standard is having a patient spend four to six hours with a neuropsychologist mm -hmm. and go through batteries and batteries and batteries of testing. Very challenging for the patient, very stressful for patients. Um, but this one hour, 45 minutes to one hour assessment that we do through Krayos, um, I think is pretty good as an assessment. Um, when it comes to brain games, have you guys heard of the cognitive demand theory? I have not. That's new for me. What about you, Melissa? I, I've heard the term, but I'm not familiar with the, the meaning behind it. Yeah. So this was a paper that came out last year. And as far as I know, the term was developed by uh, Dr. Tommy Wood and Josh Turknett. Dr. Tommy Wood's a MD, PhD. He's a neuroscientist. I think Josh Turknett is a, a neurologist. And they basically were looking at the data at so exactly what you asked, brain games. Like what is, what is creating a stimulus for the brain? Yeah. And basically what they found is, you know, early life, we have huge amounts of stimulus to the brain. So walking, talking, learning to socialize are the most extreme things our brains will ever learn to do in our life. Mm -hmm. And so, and these are all happening early on. School is happening early on. So the cognitive demand is very high, say in the first 20 or 30 years of a person's life. After that, kind of more middle age or approaching middle age, people tend to get a job. They're good at something and that tends to be their job and they do that thing. And they don't, they're not often doing things that are really cognitively demanding in the same way that school was. And then of course, as people get older that towards retirement age, cognitive demand really falls off a cliff because people, the demand they were getting from their job, now they're losing. Um, right. So I don't think it's, I mean, certainly there is an aging aspect to, to most dementias and especially Alzheimer's, but I also don't think people do, uh, I don't think it's helpful that people are losing all of this cognitive demand. And the analogy they draw is it's kind of like using a muscle, you know, you're demanding, you know, when you go to the gym and you're doing squats or bicep curls or whatever, you're placing demand on a muscle. And then that muscle will have a response and it will get stronger or you'll develop more cardiovascular capacity if it's like the heart and you're doing cardio. And it's the same with the brain. So in general, kind of with that as the back, kind of the backstory of this cognitive demand, it turns out that, yeah, these brain games, people like them, but there's not a ton of data that they're actually going to be helpful. So things like Lumosity or even things like, you know, people playing uh, simple games like Sudoku and things like that or crossword puzzles. Those things are going to be far less demanding and stimulating to the brain than, say, learning a musical instrument, mm. learning to dance. You guys talked about dance earlier. Yes. Uh, or we were talking offline about dance. Uh, the data on dance is pretty amazing when it comes to, you know, again, following cohorts of people who have been lifetime dancers and their risk of dementia uh, or neurodegeneration altogether is much, much lower. Oh, I love that. So, uh, yeah, so getting, uh, doing activities that challenge the body and the brain concurrently. Mm -hmm. Certainly dance is, or learning a musical instrument, the fine motor skills of learning a musical instrument, but it could be a sport. It could be uh, a martial art, you know, it could be yoga or Tai Chi, but it's something where you're going to have to learn motor patterns. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it's going to be far more complicated than say, you know, going for a run on a treadmill. You know? Yeah. What about Although, learning a new language? Uh, as yeah, far I, think as, I mean, falls... obviously you are not removing the whole body. You're just moving your mouth, but I'd be curious. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that that, I, I think that that offers some of those similar benefits, probably learning a new language. Yeah. I think music in general, uh, you know, learning music is kind of like learning a language, you mm -hmm. know, certainly so, uh, but there, there seems to be something added when you add on the music also. So music offers some global, global cognitive benefits. And once you're interacting with music through dance or learning an instrument, you know, you even, you get even more of a benefit. So cool. I love that. I just uh, went to my first French class last night. I'm doing it for fun, not for credit. And our instructor said, I'm going to send you a song and I want you to put the lyrics all up all around your house so you can see it and play it nonstop. So you're just so sick of it. 
so I can dance to it. I can sing it. I can practice, right? <laughs> Combine yep. all of them. Hopefully that's that will great. help. Yeah. That's um, great. I love that. That's mm-hmm. that's better than mine. My cognitive demand at this point is Brazilian jiu-jitsu. So <laughs> that I get strangled like quite a the lot. Demand. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is. Yeah, but I get strangled a lot. So because <laughs> I don't. I don't know it that well. I haven't been doing it that long. So yeah, yeah. Uh, well, but it is definitely cognitively demanding. So yeah, I but. bet. Well, and on this note, to wrap it up, the last question, as far as being proactive and focusing on prevention, Dr. Horzempa, we just talked about uh, really training the brain and the body at the same time. But what else are you really interested in or maybe recent research regarding sleep or muscle mass, blood sugar control? We touched on that quite a bit as far as prevention goes. And I, I'd love to know if there's anything in the sleep realm, because I think that that's a fascinating uh, part of life that a lot of people, you know, a lot of night owls out there who might be listening. Is there anything in terms of prevention that maybe you want them to hear? Yeah, absolutely. So a few things with sleep. Yeah, certainly it raises the risk of all major diseases when people are sleeping poorly, either in quality or quantity. And so, yeah, cancer risk goes up probably because the immune system is uh, practicing that immune surveillance, Mm. uh, you know, less well, you know, it's less able to detect these earlier cancers. Cardiovascular disease goes up. Certainly, you know, all credit goes to Matt Walker for getting the word out about sleep and Mm. uh, his book, Why We Sleep is Remarkable. But certainly, yeah, one of the things that he brings attention to there is like, yeah, daylight savings time, losing an hour of sleep increases uh, heart attacks, you know, by a a pretty substantial number, you know, certainly in places that observe daylight savings time. I'm in one place that doesn't, but most places do. (laughs) So, uh, you know, there's a cardiovascular risk component there too. And of course, what we've been talking about neurodegeneration, I think a lot of sleep comes back to what we call sleep hygiene. So going to bed and waking up at the same time. Yeah. In these behaviors around sleep is kind of what we mean when we say sleep hygiene. So, you know, making sure that you're getting bright light in the morning, making sure in the evening time that light is dimmer, it's more yellow, orange, red, and it's lower in the visual field. Mm-hmm. Uh, so doing, you know, having that light exposure that's different throughout the day, brighter earlier, dimmer later. Lower um, in the visual field, that's new for me. Do you mean, so rather than having the lights on, uh, up top, you know, the ceiling uh, lights, yep. having lamps. Is that what you mean? Yeah. So the photoreceptors in the eye that are kind of tracking light can determine where that light is. And that the thought is lights that are overhead lights are going to be mistaken for the sun, Ah, Whoa, wow. which we don't want when you're going to be going to bed in like right. an hour or two. Yeah. That's very so. interesting. I haven't heard that yet before either. Wow. Yep. Blown our um, mind here, Dr. Gazempa. <laughs> yeah. And I think probably is a practical thing that most people can try heat exposure before bed. And the rule I tell my patients is the more extreme that heat exposure, the farther out from bed. So uh, an example of extreme heat exposure would be sauna. So if somebody's doing the sauna, maybe we put that an hour or two away from bed. Mm. Uh, So if you're going to bed at 10 o'clock, around eight or nine o'clock. If you're doing a hot tub, uh, probably an hour should be good, 30 minutes even, or a hot bath. And if you're doing a hot shower, probably the least extreme version of heat, you could do that right before bed. But heating yourself up a little bit before bed will allow you to actually cool more efficiently once you get in bed. Mm. And our body temperature has to cool by about two to three degrees for us to get into deep sleep. That's a great trick. That kind of goes back to the nature cure, which is kind of the, the foundational of naturopathic medicine, always ending on cold. And so that would be using water and using hot and then cold water, but always ending on, on cold to warm the body up uh, on its own. But you're talking about kind of a different concept. You want to cool the body down for sleep. Exactly. So that's really yeah. interesting. And we sleep better when we're cooler. So yep. it makes sense. But yeah, so many different ways to kind of wrap our minds around uh, uh, hot and cold there. So yeah, I generally have people put cold earlier in the day Yeah, because of the norepinephrine release that you get with it. And that can be why now some people do swear they take cold showers and get in bed and sleep amazing. Uh, but I think it can be very activating for people. Right. Uh, well, yeah, because yeah. it leads to a lot of warming, which we may, may not want when we're trying to get restful sleep. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Makes sense. Well, Dr. Uh, Horzampa, we've definitely touched on so many good tools in this podcast. I'm like taking notes simultaneously, like in my brain, so I can like remember all of these tips that you talk, uh, talked about today. And I know our listeners are definitely going to take a lot out of this episode. And before we wrap up here, I do want to go through a couple of rapid fire questions just for fun. So the first one I have for you 
is I know you just just talked about a little bit about night routines and sleep, but do you have a specific morning routine and do you have a favorite kind of biohack that you can't live without to start the day? Mm, yes, yes to both. So yeah, my morning routine, I usually wake up before anyone in my house. So I try to get things done before anybody else is awake. So I wake up early. Uh, I usually, I have a ice bath. So I have a cold plunge that I jump in, which is really hard on cold days, but it's still managed to do it. I usually then go right into exercise so I can kind of warm up during exercise. And uh, we'll, I mean, my exercise will vary a lot, but it'll be some strength days, some cardiovascular days, some days that are just, uh, you know, focusing on different, you know, movement training aspects or mobility. And I'll do all that, you know, immediately after the ice bath. And probably my morning thing that I really feel like I can't live without is I do do sauna right after right after the uh, exercise. Oh, that sounds wonderful. And I just love the sauna. I, I really don't like the ice bath, but I like the sauna. <laughs> All right. Just out of curiosity, I have to know brands. What, uh, you know, what cold plunge are you using? And is it inside or outside? Uh, so it's, well, it's in my garage. So it's susceptible to kind of okay. outdoor temperatures. But literally, I kind of have a DIY version that I make roughly every three years when the chest freezer fails. But it's a chest freezer. It's a fish tank filter. It's an ozonator. It's a wall outlet thermometer. And yeah, basically that's it. And, and a chest freezer, obviously, which does the cooling. So uh, I have one of those. I'm, maybe the next time my chest freezer fails, maybe I'll get a cold plunge at this point. I always kind of go back and forth on that. But yeah. I love it. Wow. It's definitely quite the morning routine. Yeah. Usually I'm trying to get that done before my kids wake up or my wife wakes up. And usually I'm successful. So. It's admirable. Yeah. I was going to ask, what is, how long is that in total? Start to finish? Two hours? Three hours? No, not that long. It's probably... 75 minutes to an, an hour and a half in that range. Awesome. Well, next question I have for you is, what is the best and worst piece of advice that you've ever received? This can be related to your career field, your niche, or it can be totally not unrelated. I don't know, best and worst. I mean, I think, I think worst was probably, uh, I remember being in, as an undergrad, basically speaking with not guidance counselors, because that's more of a high school thing, but you know, folks who were helping you track your career trajectory. And I had multiples of these people. And one of them was basically kind of framing it as, well, you should do, you should do basically whatever's going to allow you to make the most money. Mm -hmm. That was kind of the, it, it wasn't, there was no, there was no like, what are you interested in or passionate about? And on the converse of that, I've gotten this advice from many people, but I think probably my mom is the one that, that, you know, really sticks is that, and it's, it's kind of a cliche, but it's like, yeah, if you love the work you do, you, it's never going to really be work. You know, yeah. you're always going to love doing it and you're going to be able to kind of follow your passion. So I kind of, that spoke to me a lot more than, you know, go into whatever will make you the most money. Jeez. Not to, I've had friends do that too, and that's fine, but. That yeah. person sounds like they were projecting. Maybe they, they needed to find <laughs> their passion. <laughs> They're unloading yeah, on you. Be. Yeah, it could be. Who knows? It could be. So. You know, I actually love that. That's the, the same piece of advice that my mom always gave me. You know, if you really love what you're doing, you're really never going to work a day in your life. So it's, it's awesome. Yeah. Well, I feel like we've touched on so many great things today, Dr. Horzempa. I'm, I just want to thank you for your time and all of the knowledge that you've shared with our listeners. And I want to thank everyone for tuning in today. And I just want to have you shout out, where can our listeners find you? Your, your website, your socials, just if they want to learn more. Yeah, so all the socials are uh, at Dan Horzempa, MD. The website is drhorzempa.com, so doctor with the DR. We, I'm just starting a podcast, so I'm just kind of going into this realm uh, as well, and that's the Quality of Life Prescription, which uh, it's qualityofliferx.com for that. And thank you so much for having me. This has been so much fun. Absolutely, and thank you everyone for tuning in. And until next time, I'm wishing you all vibrant health and wellness. Thank you so much for being here today. Don't forget to leave us a review and subscribe so we can continue to pay it forward together. And remember, the key to longevity is knowledge. Keep learning, growing, and tuning in to the Vibrant Wellness Podcast to discover the latest insights and strategies for optimal health. Join us again next week. Just a reminder, this podcast is for educational and informational purposes and is not a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. The views expressed by guests and hosts are their own and do not necessarily reflect the official policy of Vibrant Wellness. 
As always, consult your healthcare provider before applying any recommendations that you heard here today.